My name is uh, Merle Allen. I'm uh, the brother and uh, bass player of the Murder Junkies from New York City. Um, uh, Gigi Allen was, for those of you that don't know, was uh, the most uh, controversial, uh, most outrageous uh, performer uh, in the history of rock and roll, underground rock and roll. And uh, his uh, career spanned from beginning in 1978 with uh, the Jabbers and uh, ended in 1993 with uh, us, the Murder Junkies, as his band uh, due to a heroin overdose uh, in New York City. basically angry um, with the world in general, you know, uh, at an early age, uh, you know, having to, you know, we grew up in a small town in Littleton, New Hampshire, and uh, most of the people that, that we lived with and around were, you know, rednecks and farmers and jocks and things like that, and, you know, we started uh, into music at a very early age, and, you know, we were pretty much the outcasts you know, because of the way, you know, we dressed and the way that we thought and our attitude and stuff like that. And I think it basically just progressed uh, through the years, um, you know, with, especially with rock and roll, um, you know, getting to the point where it is now that it's such a corporate thing and, and all the bands are basically, you know, in it for a lot of money. And most bands, uh, you know, want to sound like the next band that's popular, and it really isn't much of a punk rock scene anymore. It's, it's just, uh, it's gone to an alternative. You know, what you call punk rock now is just a joke. You know, and I think that uh, there wasn't any excitement, and there wasn't any danger, and you know, basically, he wanted to bring danger back to rock and roll because, uh, you know, he felt that when you were rock and roll and you're on stage, you should be able to express yourself in any way that you wanted to, you know, freedom all the way, no limits, no laws, no boundaries. And that's, you know, yeah, that's basically what he did. I mean, he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't care. He had, he had been, he'd been arrested so many times and he'd spent three years in prison and, uh, you know, the law, the government, nothing would, you know, could control him. You know, he did and said exactly what he wanted to do and say. We enjoyed his music. We liked what he was doing. We liked the music. We liked his message. And, um, you know, it wasn't because he was Gigi Allen would start a band and be with him, you know. I mean, we believed in what he was doing, you know. I mean, we never took it to the extreme that he did. You know, when Gigi was, it, it was basically two separate you know, things going on on stage. Gigi would be on set and, and other bodily fluids while we were basically his foundation behind him, you know, solid band that he really had been lacking for, for many years as far as being able to keep a complete band together for that length of time, you know. Because before that, I mean, he had played with many, many different bands. And, uh, you know, they would play with him for a few shows here, a few shows there, but, you know, they they just couldn't keep it together, didn't want to deal with what he was doing or whatnot, but, you know, we we had no problem with that, you know, but but we weren't doing what he was doing. We were his band, you know. We, we were focusing on the music, and he was focusing on, you know, his message and his hatred and his violence. Went to prison in um, 1989, um, the reason he went to prison was uh, he had had rough sex with uh, a girl in Michigan, um, and what happened was uh, she asked the whole band at that time to come back to her apartment and have sex with her, and uh, they ended up tying her up. And Gigi spent, you know, uh, a course of a day or two, you know beating her and burning her and carving her breasts up and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, but it was a consensual thing, but I think 
you know, because of the fact that he was Gigi Allen and he was, you know, public enemy number one. It was like, let's, let's nail him to the cross and, you know, put him in prison as long as we can and keep him away from, you know, life, you know. Fuck you, man! Get out of here! Somebody get her out of here, because I'm going to kill her, and I don't want to kill an underage girl. Gigi never really talked too much about his time in prison. But uh, uh, he did a lot of work while he was in prison. He did a lot of interviews. He wrote a lot of lyrics, things like that. Prison, he, w he didn't let prison slow him down. You know, he did as much as he could to, for his career while he was in prison. Even though he couldn't be out performing and playing, he was promoting himself. And I feel that uh, the time that he spent in prison um, made him a stronger person and filled him with much more hatred. You know, it, you could you could see by watching, you know, if you watch his, you know, any of his videos or things like that through through the late '80s, where he was basically a fallen down drunk, picking up different bands in different towns uh, that you know would just go on stage and jam, and he would just you know sing things off the top of his head and. You know, it was it was a different scene then. He was more abusive to himself as opposed to when he got out of prison. He was much more focused in his mind, his body, and his soul. And he was more hell-bent on fucking other people up. And, you know, you, could, you can just see by, from watching some of the videos that there was a lot more violence and uh, hatred directed towards the audience as opposed to himself so no he but he never really talked too much about uh, you know his life in prison but I'm sure he did his time and you know put up with the bullshit that he had to put up with and uh, but but he did he worked a lot while he was in prison he didn't let it. he drank a lot Gigi I could watch Gigi drink a whole fifth of Jim Beam every day you know and it, I think it, I think for him I mean he was he definitely you know was just a drunk as far as doing drugs goes Gigi did drugs when they were available when somebody gave them to him but uh, this big misconception about Gigi being a junkie is totally false you know uh, a junkie couldn't uh, put himself through what Gigi put himself through every day, you know. And, uh, yeah, he drank a lot, and I think the alcohol, uh, you know, probably relieved some of his pain during, uh, you know. Basic basically, he would sleep all day after a show. We would drive on to a show. He would sleep all day, and by the time uh, early evening would come around, he'd wake up and start drinking, and that basically was what got him going. That was... That was his drug, you know, it was like, he'd start, he'd just start drinking, and he was a very high-strung person, so, you know, he had a lot of energy, but, uh, yeah, you know, alcohol to him was like, you know, was the thing that, that motivated him and got him through probably a lot of the show. Hey, I kill everything I fuck. Uh, he didn't have AIDS, but, uh, at one time, at one point in his career, back in 1989, he put an ad in Maximum Rock and Roll looking for someone with AIDS to have sex with. <laughs> so, uh, but no, he didn't have AIDS, but, uh, you know, if he had had AIDS, he would have gone around fucking everyone he could to give them AIDS, too, I'm sure. But uh, let's face it, there weren't too many people that wanted to fuck Gigi, you know, and he wasn't... Uh, uh, that much into sex anyway. He was more into, uh, you know, jerking off, uh, you know, having women piss in his mouth, uh, you know, smelling uh, soiled panties and shit like that, you know. He, he would collect, like, at shows, he would collect women's urine in a, in a jar. He'd get their panties. He'd go back to the hotel and you know, drink the piss and put it on the panties and sniff the panties and jerk off, you know. That was, that was his, his form of, of sex most of the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess 
you know, that way he didn't have to deal with, you know, any bullshit. And, you know, I can have what I want, and when I'm done, I don't have to, you know, have anybody around to you know, take any of his energy or whatever. <laughs> you know, Gigi's time had not come to die at that point. Um, you know, maybe earlier on in the late 80s, I would have expected it, but, you know, I, and, and, you know, people ask me, was I, you know, how could you be surprised that he died, you know? Of course, I always knew that one, at one point, it would come to that, but um, the day of the gas station show, you know, the fact that he wasn't used to doing, doing drugs like that at that point of his life was probably the leading factor to his death. But I was wondering, uh, but, it wasn't the way that, but it wasn't the way that he planned on dying, and, I, and I'll tell you right now that that was, you know, the last way, the last way he would have ever wanted to have died was, you know, uh, a, a kind of death like that, you know, because he wanted to go out in a violent way. I mean, he wanted to kill himself on stage, and, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have done it, and he would have taken a lot of people with him. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, it was it was tough. The first uh, first year or so without Gigi was very difficult because people didn't really understand that you know that we weren't trying to imitate Gigi. There was never going to be another Gigi Allen. I mean, that's why Gigi's so special because he's one of a kind. You know. Uh, so, you know, we had a hard time uh, getting people to accept us because at that point we didn't have any of our own material, which I could understand. So, uh, we recorded a CD called Feed My Sleaze in, uh, 1995 and, uh, people really liked it. Then we recorded a single called, uh, The Right to Remain Violent. And, um, you know, over the course of the last few years, people have, you know, are, are beginning to realize that we're not trying to be like Gigi. We're not trying to be a Gigi cover band. You know, we're our own band. We have our own material. We don't go on stage to play Gigi songs. And, uh, you know, people are accepting us. They like our music. And, uh... You know, that's that's basically why we're continuing and, and we're continuing to gain more fans you know and it's it's not easy you know and we're not you know we're not trying to live off Gigi's name you know because it's not an easy thing being Gigi's band you know there are good points about it but there's also being blacklisted from clubs because of you know just because of ignorant people that think oh this is Gigi Allen's band they're a bunch of fuck-ups you know they suck the whole trip you know so you know, there's the pros and the cons of being Gigi's band, but, you know, I'm proud to say that I played with Gigi, and, you know, whether it's a good thing to some people or a bad thing, you know, who cares? Yeah. I'm basically um, doing what I can through um, video that we've documented over the course of the time that we spent with him, um, which, you know, I had the foresight to think ahead um, you know, when the actuality of his death did come, that there would be something for people to see for, you know, generations to come or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I basically do this uh, to keep Gigi's name and legend, you know, there are a lot of new kids out there now that are just finding out about him. And that want to hear his music, want to see his performances on video. So I basically, you know, do what I do as far as distributing his music, his videos, um, for that reason, to keep his name alive. And, uh, you know, of course, there's always going to be somebody out there that thinks I'm doing it to make a lot of money. Well, that's not the reason, that's for sure, because if I wanted to make a lot of money, I don't think I would be in this business in this band, you know? And sometimes people think that, oh yeah, you're just doing it to make money off your brother, you know, which is, you know, fine, what people are gonna think what they want, but that's an ignorant attitude to have, you know? If you really wanna think about it, there's a lot of people out there that wanna see it, and I'm just 
providing it. If the people didn't want to see it, what, to, what would be the sense of me to do it, you know? Um, and, you know, people should just understand that. I mean, sure, I could take all of the footage, put it on the shelf, and, you know, let's forget about Gigi Allen and let his name die, and, and you know, we could go back to the same boring bullshit that we deal with every day in rock and roll, you know? But I, I just think that, you know, his name should be kept alive so that other people coming up in music will see something like that and say, hey, I don't have to be like every other band. I can do something different and I can stretch the limits because this guy right here, you know, made it possible for me, you know. And I think that um, that's one of the reasons why he should be continued to, to be viewed and have his music be listened to. And, and let's not forget about it because if we forget about it, then we're just giving up and saying that what's out there now is fine and acceptable and you know I think that's that's bullshit you know, I think somebody you know there will never be another Gigi Allen but I think if people can be influenced by Gigi then maybe somewhere down the line we will hear some interesting music and see an interesting show <laughs> de var hellige, og øh, koncerterne, det var øh, ritualer, som gik ud på at udstille volden i det amerikanske samfund og sådan noget. Det var noget af det, som jeg startede med at høre om T.J. Allen, og det synes jeg var noget af det fedeste, jeg har hørt i lang tid. Og så begyndte jeg at lytte til hans musik, og jeg kunne godt lide hans tekster og hele hans altså, attitude til rockindustrien, ikke? Så øh, jeg, jeg var bare T.J. Allen-fan, og øh, så mødte jeg Møde. Jeg var i New York her sidste år i tre måneder. Og så snakkede jeg med Møde en aften, øhm, og så sagde han, om jeg ikke kunne hjælpe dem med at få bandet her til Danmark. Og det havde jeg prøvet på. Ja, sidste år prøvede jeg på at lave en turné for Møde og øhm, men jeg kunne ikke finde pengene. Og jeg kunne ikke rigtig overskue, fordi hvis jeg skulle lave en turné med dem, så skulle jeg også have dem ud i Tyskland og i, i Norge. Og 
Det kunne jeg ikke rigtig overskue. Så vi fandt ud af, at det ville egentlig være meget godt at starte vores samarbejde med, at jeg lavede den her filmturné for ham. Fordi det, så skulle jeg bare skaffe en flybillet, og jeg skulle bare hook ham op på tre filmklubber i Danmark. Grunden til, at jeg, jeg gerne vil, grund til, at jeg har gjort det, det er fordi, jeg synes, at Didi Allen han, øh, er den fedeste performer, jeg nogensinde har set. Han er ægte. Han, øh, han er intelligent. Han, han siger nogle ting, som, som er værd at tænke over. Altså, han tager pis på hele musikindustrien, han tager pis på hele samfundet, og han investerer sin egen krop i sit udtryk. Han er ikke sådan en eller anden wimp, øh, som sådan sidder og siger kusse på sidelinjen, og så skynder sig hjem i en eller anden forstad. Øh. Jeg, jeg har været meget glad for arrangementet i Aalborg, og jeg har været meget glad for arrangementet i Aarhus, fordi altså, det viser sig at der er en masse mennesker i Danmark, som godt kan forstå DJ, og som, har, som kan lide hans holdning og attitude, ikke? Og som, stiller nogle gode spørgsmål til Møde, og Møde er jo en meget charmerende fortæller. Øh, men altså, jeg var lidt skuffet over arrangementet i går i filmhuset, og jeg var jo ved at komme op og slås med ham, den fyr, som øh, Møde sloges med øh, inde på publikumsrækkerne, ikke? Bagefter. Altså, jeg følte, det var meget ydmygende, at, at Møde, han gider komme helt herover fra New York, ikke? Og så bliver han faktisk øh, angrebet af en fuld idiot, som øh, ikke engang giver Møde lov til at forklare, forklare, hvorfor, hvorfor møderen fortsætter med at have møder junkies, og det ikke er noget rip-off af, af Gigi's navn. Det blev jeg meget skuffet, og jeg blev meget rystet, jeg var meget rystet bagefter. Fordi der var ingen, der greb ind. Altså, pludselig så lå møderen jo bare slås øh, ned på publikumsrækkerne. Jeg synes, stemningen i går i filmhuset var, den var ikke så fed. Altså, jeg synes, folk var meget kritiske. Altså, som om møderen var en eller anden stor kapitalist. Altså, han kan have dårligt betalt sin husleje i, på Manhattan, ved jeg, ikke? Øhm, men jeg er selvfølgelig glad for, at, at, at det lykkedes uden filmhuset, så øh, var Møller ikke her i dag, fordi øh, det er filmhuset, som har betalt flybilletten, ikke? Jeg snakkede med Møller om, at det kunne være meget godt at have en lille forfilm, før man gik i gang med, med hele det her. Hans film. Og så havde jeg jo sådan lavet to trashfilm for ingen penge, øh, sådan, hvor jeg selv filmer. Og, altså, det er sådan en rigtig low life, øh, scumbag, øh, æstetik, ikke? Med vis reference til John Waters og, og sådan noget. Og den første handler om en, en bådflygtning, som føler, at han bliver pisset på mentalt set i, i Danmark. Øh, så en dag bestemmer han sig for at gøre det synligt. Så han øh, tager tøjet af og sætter sig i et badekar midt på gaden med et skilt, hvor der står Please help me, I'm a refugee, piss on me. Og, øh, og det var egentlig sådan en happening, vi lavede. Øh, og det er så det, der er på filmen. Ikke? Kan man sige, at folk de bare går forbi, altså de skulle lige glade, altså. Altså, da han så senere i filmen blev skudt, altså, det, der var ikke nogen, der reagerede. Øhm, så det ene film handler egentlig om, at, pub, at, at folk øh, ikke tager stilling til noget som helst længere. A Domestic Hole er, er en helt ny lille trashfilm, som jeg har lavet sammen med min ven Bo. Øh, og den handler om, hvad der sker, hvis du undertrykker din seksualitet, så går du og æder og Øh, og så, øh, så, altså, så har jeg så valgt, at det skal være en husmor, Irma Henriksen, fantastiske Irma Henriksen, en af de få stars, jeg mener, vi har i Danmark. Øh, hun spiller så den her husmor, der gemmer sin mad rundt omkring og trøster, spiser og undertrykker sin seksualitet. Og så en dag sker der sådan noget magisk, da hun støvsuger. Hun finder sådan en tryllestav, og da hun, da hun ryster den her tryllestav, så sker der lige pludselig det, og der er en fe. Men det er ikke en hvilken som helst fe. Det er en stor, tyk transvestit, som, som er en pornofe. Øhm, og så sker jeg vil ikke fortælle, hvad der sker ellers, vel. Men det er en, men, og møde, altså, jeg havde selv sådan i filmhuset. Jeg havde selv, når jeg går til et arrangement, så er der nogle andre, som skal promovere et eller andet lort. Og man kommer jo egentlig for at se det, man har betalt for, ikke? Man kommer ikke for at se et eller andet andet bras. Øhm, så jeg havde sådan, ej, jeg gider sgu ikke at vise den i filmhuset. Men så sagde Møller selv, at han, kan, han kunne åbenbart godt lide dem begge to, så han sagde, altså, vis den, jeg vil godt have, at du viser den, fordi det, det er godt, der er noget lidt andet, før vi går i gang med, med det væsentlige, ikke? Accelerate on high I listen to no one You 
you I've got to you. Don't ever try and get too close, cause I'm a burning too. Everyone around me is someone I will play. I'm living out my life and I'm living day to day. Within the perimeters of this world, I just don't feel the right. I'm living by the laws of a dawn and a night. My soul cannot be tamed. I'm living just to die. I'm living by myself on the outskirts of life. Living day to day, living day by day. The only paycheck that I know is what I'll feel today. I like my girl real young, but keep marriage out of mind. I lick them and forget them, because for friends I have no time. Never settle down, living just to cry. But all the things I take in life are things that you can't buy. I creep all through the daytime and I creep all through the night. But I'll live until I die on the outskirts of life. Within the perimeter of this world, I just don't feel real right. I'm living by the laws of a gun and a night. My soul cannot be tamed. I'm living just to die. I'm living by myself on the outskirts of life. Don't try talking to me, I just don't have time. You bore me with your useless life, but you never know about mine. Listen to me closely, do exactly what I say. Give me what I want from you, or I'll take it anyway. Liquor, drugs, whores, and greyhound sons, and violence, too. In my world, I'm living by the law of who does who. I have no fear of nothing, each day I'm set to start, so I'm living by myself on the outskirts of life. Within the perimeter of this world, I just don't feel real right. I'm living by the laws of a gun and a knife. My soul cannot be tamed, cause I'm living just to die. I'm living by myself on the outskirts of life.
He was in the band at the time. Well, he, he was in the band, um, yeah, but he, he looked like the first, right for a short period of time he was in the band. Like and he, he rehearsed band. with us, but uh, when it came time to go on the road, you know. Well, I, I heard rumors about uh, Meredith Junkies coming to Copenhagen. Is that true or is that no, a lie? It's just uh, no, it's probably going to happen maybe mm -hmm. in September, October. Oh, September, yeah. October? Hey, I got a question. Uh, did you and Gigi have uh, like an uh, unwritten agreement that he wouldn't uh, throw his shit at you during shows? Or did you have to accept having thrown shit at you as an occupational hazard? I, I like that. I, I want to hear some different questions tonight. It was with my uh, No, it's like being, being behind him on stage was probably the safest place to be. Because he was always... Uh, you know, shooting at the front of him. <laughs> now he's dead. Now he's dead. Uh, have you got any uh, any any uh, further uh, sort of uh, associations towards your own uh, sort of being on the scene? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Uh, now he's dead. Do you feel that you have some uh, responsibility on being sort of behind him? Uh, No, I mean, we're, you know, we're doing our own thing now, you know, I mean, we were basically, you know, when we were playing with Gigi, there were two things happening. Gigi was doing his show, mm. which, you know, was pretty violent, and uh, he had his own thing going on, and we were basically the foundation, the solid band behind him, you know. So, so we, what now? Well, we're basically playing the same style of music. We have our own material now. Uh, we're playing the same style of music, but, you know, we're not concentrating on the violence that Gigi was doing because that would be impossible. It would be an insult to him and it would, you know, so be what ridiculous do you do for then? everybody else. You know? no. So we're not trying to be like Gigi. No, uh, no. So what do you do then? Are you still playing his, uh, well, his mean, songs? Still no, playing his no. songs? I mean, you know, we play maybe one of his old songs or two of them just because people want to hear it. Yeah. You know? But most of our set consists of uh, material from Feed My Sleeze, which is our first CD without Gigi, yeah. and then the single, The Right yeah. to Remain Violent, and we also played some songs from Brutality and Bloodshed for All that we wrote the music to. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're not trying to be a Gigi cover. So, uh, I mean, people, you know, people that come to our show now, they have to realize that, you know, sure, Gigi's sure. dead. There's one that was once in a lifetime that something like that's going to happen. Mm, mm. And if they want to come because they like our music, that's great, you know. But if they want to come to see somebody shit on stage, so that's the that's point. Done. So what's the point? Shut up, cunt. The American lifestyle sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't fear him because I knew him so well that I knew, you know when to back off and when he was going to explode, you know. But I could see, you know, I saw many times when, uh, you know, the wrong person said the wrong thing to him and he went off on him and I knew he would, you know. I didn't have to So did, did you I, see him as a romantic person, your brother? Well, some people. I mean, you know, you know uh, I think it's quite interesting because I didn't see him as a, as a, as an, uh, a really bad person. No. Well, some people still don't, uh, still don't believe in that he was that the violent person in his head. Do you really mean that? What's that? Do you believe in that he was that violent person in his head? In the head. Yeah, sure. Some people you don't know, don't think that. You know, they can't I mean, believe all this shit is happening. What's that? They don't believe that he was the violent man in his head. They, Who does? Yeah. I, uh, Have you been down to my... I read them on. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.